I, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. It's a real honor for me uh, to be speaking uh, in this series, which has really been excellent. Uh, and so, uh, as uh, you were told a few minutes ago, uh, I'm going to give a talk about our work towards uh, understanding the functional compartmentalization of photoreceptors. Uh, and so we'll ju jump right into it here um, with uh, just to get us oriented, uh, a schematic of the eye. You guys don't need to see this, of course, but we're re really interested in understanding how the photoreceptors, which are the uh, most distal neurons in the retina, uh, uh, form the different compartments and how proteins are localized to those compartments and, and sort of our efforts to understand how that works. Um, so um, this is just a schematic of a rod photoreceptor. Uh, you all basically know this as well, but uh, uh, the photoreceptors are uh, structurally compartmentalized uh, in the sense that they have this outer segment compartment, which is a modified cilium that is connected through what's called the connecting cilium, which is really a transition zone of cilia uh, to the inner segment or cell body of the photoreceptor which forms the second major compartment. And then the third major compartment is the synapse down here, which conveys visual information to downstream neurons. And of course, everybody here, I think, knows that there is a standing circulating current in dark adapted photoreceptors uh, that uh, sets the membrane potential and controls release of uh, transmitter at the synapse. And uh, we also know that uh, as uh, that the circulating current is suppressed in a graded manner with increasing intensities of light, as shown from this uh, uh, figure from a past life of mine. Um, so um, the important thing is that this structural compartmentalization is recapitulated uh, in the compartmentalization of proteins. So the uh, outer segment contains proteins that are relevant to phototransduction, like rhodopsin, the cyclonucleotide needed channels, guanylate cyclase, et cetera, et cetera, and also some structural proteins. The inner segment contains the potassium channels that uh, counter the inward current of the outer segment, uh, as well as uh, proteins that are involved in the transcription and translation of genes and proteins. And then the synapse has proteins like complexins and bassoon. Uh, which are responsible for synaptic vesicle release. And we've learned a fair amount about how these proteins uh, um, uh, might be localized, and, and in particular, things like uh, interaction partners and uh, uh, sequences on the proteins that are important for addressing them to different compartments. But in our view, uh, and, and that work has mainly been done sort of with molecular genetic approaches and a histological analysis of distributions of the proteins in fixed uh, tissues. Uh, but our view is that uh, we can't really understand this fully without uh, uh, examining the dynamics of the proteins in living cells. And so that is uh, uh, a, a frontier that, that we've been pushing in the lab. And we've used a, a multifaceted approach to getting at these questions, uh, which I've sort of outlined here. Uh, we evaluate the biophysical properties of proteins in vitro, say for instance, by doing analytical ultracentrifugation. We uh, generate living cells that express proteins that are labeled uh, with GFP and, and their variants. Uh, Xenopus labes is one of our favorite animal models that we use, but we also use uh, some cell culture models uh, in this work. We have developed some uh, live cell microscopy approaches so that we can uh, examine the molecules in the cells. And then over the years, we've uh, developed a, a quantitative computational model that uh, we use to see how this all comes together ultimately. So um, I, I'm going to talk about two main um, projects in the lab. We have several, but uh, we'll just talk about these today. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're going to talk about initially is uh, how soluble proteins are compartmentalized in photoreceptors. And we're going to use Arrestin-1 uh, as, as a model protein for that. 
And then in the second part, we're going to talk about how intrinsic membrane proteins may be compartmentalized. And specifically, we're going to look at how uh, GPCRs, rhodopsin, and other ciliary GPCRs are um, compartmentalized in, in uh, cilia. So let's start with this uh, first topic. Um, and uh, you know we've known actually for a very long time now, uh, decades at this point, that arrestin, uh, which is a protein that's important for the shutoff of the phototransduction cascade, uh, because it binds to light activated phosphorylated rhodopsin and, and, and in, uh, 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 inhibits the further activation of the G protein transducin. So this protein in dark adapted photoreceptors is found mainly uh, in the cell body. And so what I'm showing you here are uh, uh, immunohistochemical uh, uh, images uh, of a uh, Xenopus retina that has been stained uh, using arrestin antibody staining. Um, and uh, so most of the arrestin is found in this uh, intersegment compartment. Of course, uh, upon illumination, and this has also been known for a long time, uh, uh, usually rather strong illumination, most of the arrestin moves into the outer segment compartment. So uh, the uh, reason for arrest and moving to the outer segment uh, has mostly is mostly accepted as uh, the formation of a binding sink uh, of phosphorylated light activated rhodopsin in the outer segment. The mechanism by which uh, it's localized to the inner segment in, in dark adapted photoreceptors uh, has remained uh, sort of controversial. Um, a few years ago now at this point, um, we uh, proposed a mechanism by which uh, the structure of the photoreceptor uh, uh, is, um, is responsible for uh, determining the, di the distribution of arrest and dark adapter photoreceptors. And this is um, a hypothesis that we call the distri distribution by steric volume exclusion hypothesis. Uh, and so this is the notion uh, photoreceptors uh, are structurally very heterogeneous. The outer segments are filled with membranous disks that are spaced at about 12, and a half, 12 or so nanometers uh, apart, which is close to the size of the molecules that reside in between the disks. Uh, and the inner segments uh, are much more sparsely populated uh, with structures, and there's much more open space. And so the notion is that this difference could drive a, a separation of molecules. Uh, and I, I'm going to show in the next slide a sort of explanation for how that works. So here what I'm showing uh, is two volumes uh, that are interconnected. Uh, they are exactly the same volume geometrically, uh, but the shapes of these spaces are different. This is a long, thin space, about 10 nanometers wide, and this is a more cubical space over here. If we introduce molecules into this space, uh, they can only approach the, uh, uh, um, the boundaries of the space to within their radii. And so that leaves uh, a, a, an effective accessible volume, uh, um, which is smaller than the geometric volume. But it turns out that the uh, that the uh, more rectangular region uh, has a, a much sharper drop off in the available volume than the square region. Uh, and that's just due to the shape of the compartment. And the result of that is that even though the concentration of the molecules is the same relative to the accessible volumes uh, in the spaces here, uh, the mass of the molecules would be partitioned into this more open space here, resulting in fewer molecules uh, in the more rectangular um, uh, space. And the advantage of this and the interesting uh, result of this is that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the rate of decline in the accessible volume is different for these two shapes as a function of the size of the molecules. So, uh, in the rectangular shape, uh, this falls off much more steeply, and it's much less sensitive in a cubicle space. So this puts up, this provides the possibility 
that, mo that molecules uh, may be partitioned in a size dependent manner. And we've known uh, for some time now that arrestin proteins form dimers and tetramers at physiological concentrations uh, in vitro, at least in mammalian species. Uh, and so uh, this uh, would suggest that this could be a regulatory mechanism for the distribution of arrestins. We, of course, tested this idea by introducing uh, different sized molecules into Xenopus rods. Uh, this is a calcine, which is a small fluorescent molecule, or a single, uh, a double GFP, or a triple GFP. Um, uh, and we find that the fluorescence level in the outer segment uh, is falling relative to the fluorescence level in the inner segment. Uh, and we can plot uh, that ratio as a function of the size of the molecules and see that this is a sort of linear uh, progression. So for arrestin molecules, what that means that is that even monomer arrestins, which are about the size of double GFPs, would uh, be partitioned uh, to the inner segment uh, and have a ratio, an OSIS ratio of about 0 0.3. The dimers and tetramers would be more strongly partitioned uh, 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 and, and likely lead to almost complete localization in the inner segment. So the arrestin uh, oligomerization that we know about uh, is, is uh, measured in uh, mammalian arrestins, primar primarily in bovine arrestin. Uh, and so we wanted to see if Xenopus arrestin uh, operates in the same way. Uh, and a very talented graduate student who is now a postdoc in the lab, Cassandra Barnes, has led this work. And so what she did is she uh, expressed and purified recombinant Xenopus arrestin and subjected them to sedimentation velocity analytical ultracentrifugation. And so this plot here just is a normalized uh, concentration as a function of Svedberg versus the sedimentation coefficient of Svedberg here. And what she sees is that at low concentrations, we have a single peak at 2.5 Svedberg. Uh, but as she increases the concentration of the arrestin, we start seeing a second peak at three Svedberg. And then at higher concentrations, this, uh, uh, all of the mass is in this three Svedberg peak. And even going to higher concentrations than this, uh, we don't see any other changes. So what this means is that uh, uh, the Xenopus arrestin is actually only forming dimers in vitro uh, and it can't form, uh, it is, it's not uh, uh, forming tetramers like the mammalian arrestin. She then plotted uh, the weight average Svedberg values as a function of the concentration here uh, and applied a monomer dimer binding isotherm, which fits the data reasonably well, and determined that the dissociation constant is about 53 micromolar for the dimerization of Xenopus arrestin. So just uh, to see if this was a one-off for uh, amphibian arrestins, she then repeated these experiments using recombinant salamander arrestin one, found essentially the same results, only forms dimers, and the binding isotherm provides a KD of 44 micromolar, not very different from the hepatocinibus. So this may be a general theme for uh, amphibian arrestin one. Uh, we, of course, uh, wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, uh, doing something wrong. So we repeated these experiments, or I should say Cassandra repeated, repeated them uh, using bovine arrestin uh, and found, again, that uh, like others have found before, as you increase the concentration, not only do you get multiple peaks of arrestin, but those peaks are shifting to higher cyber co coefficients. And this is consistent with higher order oligomers forming. She then plotted uh, the weighted S values as a function of the concentration, and this fitted very well to a monomer dimer tetramer binding isotherm, which with a KD for the dimer of 67 micromolar and for the tetramer of about 23, uh, 27. Um, so, uh, you know, bovine uh, arrestin works the same way as it does, uh, as it has been reported previously in our hands. Uh, and that gave us confidence in, in the results that Cassandra had. 
So um, some very beautiful experiments uh, from Siva Gurievich's group um, uh, determined the structure of uh, the tetramer of arestin, of, of bovine arestin, and showed that is, it is formed by a, a C-terminal, C-terminal, or N-terminal, N-terminal interaction between the individual arrestin molecules. And moreover, they identified two key amino acids that are involved in this uh, uh, oligomerization, uh, a, a tyrosine 85 in the N-terminal domain uh, and a phenylalanine 197 in the uh, C-terminal domain. And they showed that when they uh, mutated those two residues to alanines, that the uh, propensity to form multimers uh, was largely lost uh, or at least significantly inhibited. So Cassandra wanted to see if the same uh, mult, uh, uh, amino acids were important for Xenopus arrest and multimerization. Uh, and so she did sequence analysis and, and, uh, uh, and structural modeling of the protein and found uh, that uh, Y84 and F193 uh, are the uh, homologs for Y85 and 197 in, in uh, uh, Xenopus, in, in uh, bovine arrestin. Uh, and so she muta mutated those to uh, alanines, uh, did her analytical ultrasound irrigation routines, uh, fit the isotherms, uh, and showed that in fact, um, those mutations had absolutely no effect on the dimerization uh, of, of uh, Xenopus arrestin. In fact, the KDs were slightly lower, suggesting that the, the um, affinities were higher with the mutations. So um, in conclusion of, of this set of experiments, what she's shown is that uh, arrest, Xenopus arrestins form dimers. They don't form higher order oligomers, uh, and probably those uh, uh, the, the uh, region that's involved in the dimer formation differs from that in mammalian arrestins. So what does this mean in terms of the um, uh, uh, hypothesis that the distribution is governed uh, by the size of the molecules? Uh, so we evaluated this uh, by uh, examining what the distribution is predicted to be for monomer versus a mixture of monomer and dimer that is governed by uh, the KD that we measured uh, and the concentration of about three millimolar per arrestin in photoreceptors. Uh, and we show that uh, uh, we can account for about 70% of that uh, intersegment preference with monomers and uh, a further up to 90% with a monomer-dimer mixture. Um, and so, uh, the vast majority of the distribution of arrest in, in a dark adapted photoreceptor can be accounted for strictly by this very simple biophysical mechanism uh, that doesn't require any uh, uh, transport mechanisms or, or, or other uh, features. So um, one of the uh, questions that uh, we uh, want to answer as well is whether uh, arrestins form multiple multimers in photoreceptors and cells. So, so far, this has all been done in, in, in vitro. And so uh, to ask the question whether arrestin is multimerizing in living photoreceptors, we've developed uh, uh, a, a imaging approach that will allow us to look at the association between two arrestins labeled with GFPs. And this work was um, led by uh, Rajiv Pramanek, who is a postdoc in the lab, uh, 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 he's, he's now left uh, about a year ago. So the, the notion is that uh, um, uh, because GFP has a dipole, uh, it actually uh, has a preferred polarization direction for excitation, light polarization. Uh, and uh, if two arrestins were binding to each other, uh, they may uh, uh, fret uh, between uh, one uh, GFP label and onto another GFP label. Uh, and if the angle of those labels is different, then the emitted photons would be emitted at a different polarization angle. And so 
the idea was to use a tunable Thai sapphire laser, which has a very strong polarization in its light, uh, focused to the diffraction loop inside the photoreceptor. We're exciting the GFP labeled molecules here, and their uh, uh, polarization specific emission is then coming out and being split between a polarizing beam, beam splitter onto two photon detectors, uh, uh, single photon detectors that uh, are then connected to a time correlated single photon counting device. So in practice, this is how the experiment goes. In this particular case, what we're looking at uh, is live rod rods that are expressing MERS related EGFP. Uh, these are images from the parallel and perpendicular detectors in our system. We can look at a particular voxel in these uh, images and uh, uh, extract the lifetime histograms for the fluorescence of these proteins, either in the parallel or perpendicular direction. We can then uh, um, uh, apply a, a ratioing of these, a sort of corrected ratioing of these to find the time uh, dependent uh, loss of uh, polarization in the signal. This is called the anisotropy decay. Uh, and it's a biphasic uh, function of time. This fast phase is due to uh, fret, and this slow phase is due to the rotation of the molecules. Uh, and we can fit this with a double exponent and get the amplitudes and time constants here. Uh, and then ultimately what we do is uh, repeat that process for all of the voxels in these images and produce uh, a homologous fret amplitude map based on our fittings of each of those uh, voxels. And in this particular case with the MERS related GFP, what we see is that the outer segments uh, have a higher fret content uh, than the inner segments, which are uh, uh, which are uh, darker here. There's, they're much darker here than in the outer segments. And that is despite the fact that the, co the concentration of the EGFP is actually higher uh, in the cell body than it is in the outer segment. So this is really showing us that uh, in the outer segment, the risk related GFPs are, are uh, interacting closer together, likely because they are binding to the disc membranes uh, there. So ultimately, we want to move towards uh, uh, examining arrestin uh, oligomerization in living photoreceptors. And to do that, we are um, generating GFP labeled arrestins where we put the GFP at different positions on the arrestin molecule, and then ultimately ex uh, express them in uh, Xenopus rods. Now, the problem with this approach is that Xenopus rods and, and the transgenics we've done in Xenopus up until this time has, uh, uh, we've had to express our labeled proteins on the background of endogenous proteins. And so expressing a GFP arrestin on the background of millimolar endogenous arrestin really wouldn't work for this approach. Uh, so we have uh, moved on from that uh, and are collaborating now with Orson Moritz's lab at UBC. Uh, their lab has been perfecting CRISPR-Cas9 technology to manipulate uh, the, the, the genes in Xenopus, uh, and they have generated a Xenopus arrestin knockout, uh, arrestin one knockout animal uh, shown here uh, uh, with uh, a lack of uh, antibody staining for arrestin uh, compared to the wild pet animals over here. And so with this uh, approach and uh, these animals, uh, we think we'll uh, uh, be able to uh, examine uh, the uh, oligomerization of arrestin in, 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 uh, in vivo and in, in live cell in very short order. At this point, I do want to um, um, bring up that there is an alternative uh, hypothesis for the localization of arrestins to the inner segment compartment. And that is that uh, it is localized there uh, due to a, a, a binding sink caused by weak binding partners uh, in, in the inner segment of the arrestin, uh, in, in the inner segment of the photoreceptors. Um, and uh, several molecules have been identified, uh, tubulin, enolase 1, and NSF uh, as binding partners for arrestin. Uh, the concentrations of these molecules 
are not likely high enough to produce the strong localization that we see in the inner segment. But we wanted to just ask the question, what would it take to drive arrestin into the inner segment based on a binding partner that has relatively weak affinity? Uh, and so we did that using a, a mathematical modeling uh, algorithm that we have been developing over the years. Uh, this is a model that uh, predicts the distribution patterns and mobilities of proteins in different you know, throughout the length of the photoreceptor. I won't get into the details here. This is published in Nicole Maza's paper uh, in J-Cell Biology. Um, uh, but just to say uh, that the model uh, takes into account local binding, local diffusion, and local active, active transport. And I just have to say that this is something that we started uh, when I was working in, at Pew's lab, uh, and we've been developing it ever since. And it's really been a, a boon to, to the things that we are uh, working on. So the output of the model looks something like this. Uh, we're looking at the concentration of our protein of interest as a function of uh, distance along the z-axis or the, or the axial um, uh, extent of the photoreceptors. So let's do the experiment then. Uh, what we did is uh, we introduced uh, a, an arrestin binding partner uh, uh, in the inner segment and synapse only. Uh, we gave it a dissociation constant of 40 micromolar and we chose that dissociation constant because that is a dissociation constant measured for the interaction of arrestin-1 with tubulin. Um, uh, and then we looked at uh, various concentrations of that protein in those compartments, going from 0.05 millimolar or 50 micromolar up to uh, millimolar levels. And uh, what we see is that to produce that inner segment localization, uh, at a level that we observe in experiment, we really have to uh, go to six millimolar or more uh, of the binding partner in the inner segment. And I just want to remind you that rhodopsin concentration in the outer segment, uh, which is the most abundant protein in photoreceptors, is about three millimolar. So we don't think uh, that this kind of uh, binding partner uh, will uh, um, suffice to explain the distribution of arrestin and dark adaptive photoreceptors. Okay, to give you a, a quick summary uh, of our uh, results so far uh, from this part of the talk, we found that amphibian arrestin 1 forms dimers in vitro, uh, but larger order oligomers are not detected. We found that amphibian arrestin 1 appears to dimerize at, at a novel interface uh, different from uh, mammalian. Uh, we showed that steric volume exclusion can account for most of the arrestin distribution and localization in the inner segment of dark adapted photoreceptors. And we we're developing a two photon time resolved fluorescence anisotropy microscope approach to finally address the question of whether arrestin ones oligomerize in living photoreceptors. So with that, uh, I want to move on to the second part of the talk, uh, we are, where we are examining uh, the compartmentalization of intrinsic membrane proteins and specifically GPCRs in the ciliary compartment. So just uh, to orient ourselves again, uh, we actually know a fairly uh, good amount about the mechanisms by which rhodopsins are packaged into transport vesicles uh, and then transported to the apical membrane and depositing rhodopsins in that membrane near the connecting cilium. And this is work that's been done by Dushka Duretic uh, and her colleagues, mostly, uh, and a few other people. It's really beautiful work uh, and it's well worked out. Uh, and that's not what I'm going to talk about. What we're really interested in is how rhodopsin then moves from that region into the ciliary compartment and then is transported along the connecting cilium and deposited into nascent disks. Uh, and, and what are the mechanisms involved there? Now, uh, most review articles that talk about this process uh, will say, that uh, rhodopsins are coupled to IFT proteins, intrafragellar transport proteins, transport proteins, 
uh, that are then uh, connected to kinesins and, and uh, moved by motors into the, uh, along the connecting cilium and then ultimately into uh, the for newly forming disks. But this is a fairly controversial uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, we, uh, for instance, know that uh, there are IFT molecules in the region of the connecting cilia, as shown in this paper from Greg Bajur. We know that in Xenopus, we also see them along the connecting cilia, and there's even pools of them at the base of the cilia. Uh, this is uh, in a, cl a collaborative work between Catherine B. Phelps and Joe Bashars. But when uh, it's been, uh, when, when, you know, the, the role of this uh, transport has been tested using uh, uh, knockouts, uh, conditional knockouts uh, of KIP3A, which is the anterograde motor for IFT, uh, the results are somewhat uh, variable. In this earlier paper from Marzalac, uh, uh, even though uh, you've removed the KIF protein, most of the rhodopsin appears to be going to the outer segment, although there is some misalkalization to the cell body. And then later, Wolfgang Baer's group using a more rod specific uh, Cree to uh, drive uh, the knockout of TIF3A showed uh, that uh, uh, at least for rod photoreceptors, rhodopsin transport into the, uh, into the outer segment uh, was not affected. So it doesn't uh, seem, you know, it's possible that there's, there is no motor dependent movement. So we wanted to examine that further uh, and we wanted to sort of ask a general question do GPCRs in cilia couple to motor proteins? Can we detect that in live cells and characterize uh, how they're coupling and uncoupling and how they're moving uh, by motors? And this work uh, was um, carried out by an MD PhD student in the lab, Sung Su Lee, as well as uh, a postdoc by the name of Han Yin Tan. And so what they did is they expressed uh, rhodopsin or the somatostatin 3 receptor uh, in, in primary cilia cultured cells. Uh, these are IMCD3 cells for these experiments. They labeled them on the C-terminus with GFP and then sparsely labeled them by antibody coupling Q dots to a MIC tag in the extracellular domain of rhodopsin. And so this video over here is showing the results of that. The green is, of course, the GFP uh, signal. And then the red dots that are moving around are individual uh, GPCRs moving up and down the cilium. And so uh, we statistically analyzed this movement and concluded that we could not detect any motor dependent movement for the GPCRs. And if you're interested, you can uh, read our paper about that. But what we did find that is very interesting is that the uh, GPCRs tend to sample small areas of the ciliary membrane uh, for longer periods of time before jumping to other regions and then sampling those regions fairly intensively for a period of time. And when we statistically analyzed uh, that process by plotting the mean square displacement of the molecules on the cilium as a function of time step, we found that this breaks into two, uh, uh, two regions. There's an initial fast phase and a slower phase here. And this is classical uh, behavior seen in corral diffusion of molecules. So we developed a model to, to see if we could uh, figure out what the size of the corrals are and the frequency of crossing um, and fitted that model uh, to our data and found that the corral size is about 270 nanom nanometers. Uh, and keep that number in mind uh, for a little bit later on. So um, the next thing that uh, Sung Su did was to examine uh, what the corrals uh, might consist of. And so he uh, treated the cells uh, with uh, uh, drugs that uh, disrupt or stabilize filamentous actin. And so he used latrunculin A uh, or cytoclase in D to disrupt the actin filaments and found the, a, a more free movement of the 
uh, GPCRs measured by quantum dots uh, along the cilium. And then using jaspleckinolide, which uh, stabilizes F-actin, uh, uh, he showed that the movement was uh, restricted. And so this strongly suggests that the corrals that are forming uh, inside the cilium are uh, 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 delimited by uh, filamentous actin. And this is actually the first demonstration that uh, ciliary membranes uh, have such corrals and that they have a, an underlying filamentous actin uh, support system. Later, uh, that was confirmed in these really beautiful tomographic EM uh, studies from uh, Giesel et al, uh, where uh, they were able to find actin filaments underneath the uh, ciliary membrane of MDCK2 cells. And in fact, they show that the actin filaments are associated uh, with the uh, uh, microtubules of the axoneme and form uh, these regions that have a size which is uh, sort of remarkably similar to the uh, estimates of the uh, size of the corrals that we made in Sung Su's paper. So it really does look like uh, the primary cilia uh, have these corralled regions uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, change the behavior and, and movement of GPCRs within the cilia. Now, ultimately, we want to try to um, approach this uh, uh, question in photoreceptors themselves. And so uh, they, they pose a particular challenge to doing this kind of work. And that is uh, when we're trying to label uh, protein, uh, uh, things like rhodopsin with Q dots, uh, we have to do it very sparsely. And so we're really looking to uh, label one or two of these proteins on the cells. And the problem with photoreceptor cells is that they have this enormous outer segment compartment here with a plasma membrane uh, that is filled with rhodopsins. And so getting a very sparse labeling of rhodopsins in the region near the connecting cilium uh, where we want to actually study this uh, seemed uh, very challenging at, at best. So we decided to take a different approach. And that is to develop uh, a, a three-dimensional single particle tracking uh, uh, photo activation localization microscopy approach. This is a super resolution microscopy approach, but we're doing it in live cells and monitoring the movement of the particles of the proteins inside the cell. And so we're labeling uh, GPCRs like uh, rhodopsin and somatostatin receptor three with a variant of GFP called MELS4B, which flips from green to red when stimulated with a 405 nanometer laser. Uh, and I wanna mention that this work is being led by Himanshu Melotra, uh, who is a, uh, a very talented microscopist and postdoc in the lab. So what we did is we assembled a system uh, that uses an eyelash ring turf illumination, uh, which is, um, uh, focused at the uh, focal point of the objective so that we get wide field illumination on the photoreceptor. But then we're using this 405 laser to photoconvert molecules. Uh, we pass this through a Galvo system uh, and then uh, overfill the back aperture so that we can focus it to the diffraction limit. And then we can scan this in very specific regions in the photoreceptor to activate these molecules exactly where we want to activate them. We then pass the emitted uh, fluorescence through a cylindrical lens, which produces an astigmatism uh, uh, on the EMCCD chip so that uh, the spots that we're measuring actually uh, are wider uh, uh, at uh, some focal distances. They are round when in focused and then taller at uh, focus uh, on the other side of the focus. And you can take the ratio of these uh, uh, width and heights of these molecules to find the Z position with about a 50 nanometer uh, resolution. Uh, and the XY resolution of the system is about 20 nanometers. So uh, this is just an example of how this system works. 
These are uh, HTERT RPE1 cells that are expressing somatostatin receptor uh, labeled with MEOS4B. Uh, the, there's a lot of uh, background fluorescence here because uh, the protein is found uh, not only in the cilium, but also on the apical membrane surface. Uh, and in this region right here, there is a cilium uh, and we can use our GAVO scanner system, or GAVO system to stimulate uh, the uh, fluorescence at longer wavelengths just within that region. And so this is an example of how that works. Uh, we can just stimulate exactly the cilium. We photoconvert sparsely a few molecules, and then we uh, watch them move around inside the cilium. Of course, then uh, we... Uh, uh, analyze these movements. Uh, uh, we repeat this uh, cycle many times, and we use uh, um, a tracking software uh, to find uh, that the uh, individual molecules and track them for a period of time. Then they bleach out. We photoconvert new ones and track them again, uh, and eventually assemble uh, a population of even thousands of these GPCRs from single cilium, we can process them using MATLAB codes that we've developed and others have developed to uh, um, um, find the diffusion coefficients and map them onto the cilium surface to see if there's any differences depending on position. We can do other things like uh, providing vector maps of the magnitude and direction of moving, movement on the cilium uh, and virtually anything that we want to do. Uh, and so we've uh, started to uh, use this system and analyze the uh, movement of SSTR3 uh, receptors on the cilium surface. Uh, this is a histogram of all of the diffusion coefficients that uh, we have measured. And I'll just note that this is uh, from three cilia that were imaged in one afternoon. And we uh, were able to acquire uh, almost a thousand GPCR movements. To do that with quantum dots would uh, take a year, probably. Uh, so that's the real advantage of this approach: is, is being able to do uh, high volumes of, of, of proteins. We then uh, fitted uh, this uh, histogram with a double Gaussian. It's what fitted best, and uh, uh, found diffusion coefficients of 0.2 to. 0.35 or so micron squared per second. There's, there are, are very broadly um, um, uh, distributed though. Diffusion coefficients go from uh, you know, a nanometer squared per second up to more than a micron squared per second. And this is in good agreement with the results that we had uh, from the quantum dot data as well. We are also uh, beginning to examine things like how uh, ligands may be influencing uh, the movement of the GPCRs. Somatostatin seems to reduce the diffusion coefficient somewhat. We're continuing to study that further. Um, and then another thing that uh, came from this study, which is uh, really interesting, uh, is uh, that uh, when we examine the distribution of the GPCRs using uh, this super resolution approach, this palm imaging, we find that uh, they are not distributed uniformly along the cilium. And you wouldn't be able to tell that by looking at just standard confocal images. The super resolution images reveal that there is uh, um, uh, a variety of uh, places uh, that have uh, uh, stronger or weaker number, larger or fewer numbers of GPCRs associated with them. And, and then sometimes we even see them in membrane blebs that are forming on the on the cilia. Uh, just to show that that is not uh, an artifact of, of our uh, uh, SSTR, uh, of our um, SPT palm system or our palm microscope, repeated this experiment using a structured illumination approach uh, using this Nikon CSUW1 uh, Sora microscope. This is a spinning disk effectively uh, uh, structured illumination microscope. We can resolve the lumen of the cilium with this microscope. Uh, this is uh, the somatostatin receptor here. We're also showing the uh, centrin molecule uh, extending from the basal body into the lumen in the uh, transition zone of the protein uh, of the cilium. 
But again, we see that the somatostatin receptor is not uniformly distributed on, on the cilium membrane. And we decided to go and uh, uh, estimate the sizes of these uh, blobs of uh, GPCRs, uh, both on this, uh, using the SORA system as well as our uh, 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 SPT palm microscope. Uh, and this is a histogram of those uh, lengths of those um, uh, patches. Uh, and we find that the mean length is about 265 nanometers. Again, very similar to the corral length uh, that we measured uh, in Sung Su's paper uh, a few years ago. Uh, so one last little piece here towards the uh, end of the talk now. Um, um, we have found that uh, when we find cilia that are forming membrane blebs, uh, that we seem to get a higher uh, level or higher density of GPCRs in those membrane blebs. We find that both from our palm imaging and uh, uh, Himanshu has been working very hard on this and is uh, now showing it that it happens with Q-dot tracking as well where the Q-dots tend to spend uh, an inordinate amount of time sort of sampling those membrane blebs, and then they can escape and, and move around. And so this suggests that uh, somehow membrane shape uh, is uh, uh, important for uh, um, the level of, uh, of the GPCRs uh, uh, within them. So these membrane blebs may be forming a sort of uh, diffusion sink, if you will, uh, of, of proteins. Uh, and, and this uh, is an interesting idea that we think might be invo uh, important for loading, say, ectosomes that are releasing GPCRs from primary cilia, or even possibly in loading nascent discs in photoreceptors. And so we're very interested in pursuing uh, that uh, idea going forward. So uh, I just want to end uh, or uh, summarize this part of the talk. We show that GPCR is rarely coupled to IFT motors in primary cilia. We show that primary ciliary membranes are subdivided into corral regions by f actin, and that the corrals appear to lead to inhomogeneous distribution of GPCRs along cilia. And then finally, cilia membrane, membrane blebs appear to accumulate GPCRs. Uh, without hindering their motion, suggesting that there's a sort of diffusion sink uh, forming. So uh, that sort of winds up the talk. I'll just uh, leave you with this sort of conclusion statement. Uh, in our view, complete understanding of the mechanisms of cell function, functional compartmentalization, and even the, the, the um, uh, structure of the cell uh, really requires um, um, a, a biophysical character characterization of both the proteins and the cellular spaces in which they reside, evaluation of the protein dynamics using uh, live cell imaging approaches of, uh, in a variety of, of uh, different microscopes, uh, and that quantitative modeling is really essential uh, to understanding how all of this comes together. And my hope from this, my aspiration in a way, is to bring the photoreceptor cell biology and maybe ciliary cell biology to the point that phototransduction has been, where uh, we can uh, develop a quantitative model knowing the concentrations, numbers of the players, uh, and then uh, be able to predict distribution patterns uh, based on, on, on uh, th that information. So um, that's, that's really the end of the talk. I'm just going to finish off here uh, acknowledging people in the lab. You've seen a few of these through the slides. These are the current lab members. Uh, we also have some collaborations uh, at different universities. And this is our, our current funding. And so I'll end there. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. I've stunned everybody. <laughs> Peter, 
Uh, it's Steve in Buffalo. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. A brilliant talk. I, I love this work. Um, I had a, a question and I was struck by the thousand fold range of diffusion coefficients for the GPCR that you showed us. Uh, do you have uh, an understanding of the physical basis of why you would get that kind of spread? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we are, um, so there's kind of several things, right? So we showed in the uh, Sung Su paper in the Journal of Cell Biology a few years ago that uh, the membrane regions between the corral limits are actually very fluid. Uh, and we, we can have very high diffusion coefficients of the GPCRs in that space. Uh, um, on the other side of it, uh, the GPCRs may be associating uh, with uh, immobile structures, binding to them, uh, which slows them down uh, a great deal. Very slow, you know, uh, nanometer squared per second diffusion coefficients are likely caused by the molecules just not really moving. Uh, and we can, you know, we're developing different uh, uh, um, ways to analyze the data to sort of pick out those different things. We're interested in understanding, you know, uh, how tight the binding is, what is the frequency of binding, uh, and things like that, and if it's changed uh, based on things like ligand uh, association. Uh, uh, so those are, uh, you know, uh, computational tasks that we have to do uh, and, and are underway. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and in fact, in the in the chat, I, I put a speculative uh, uh, question asking if there were collisions or dwell time interactions with other proteins like a post protein or lipid domain differences like rafts where you'd have a uh, difference in uh, viscosity of uh, where there's interactions with the GPCRs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely a possibility. Um, um, you know, the we, we kind of, uh, we're, we're really using two approaches now. We haven't abandoned the Q dot approach because it actually has uh, uh, information content that these very short snippets from the SBT palm approach doesn't have, right? So in SBT palm, you're catching maybe 10 frames where the GPCR is moving, you're just catching it at that moment and then it goes away. Whereas with the, with the uh, quantum dot approach, we can look at how the GPCR is sampling for many minutes and see all kinds of different behaviors. And ultimately we wanna analyze uh, those kinds of behaviors to get at the question that you have. Are we seeing it uh, associate with things that are immobile or uh, going into uh, different uh, raft domains or something like that? Uh, uh, and uh, that's best analyzed, I think, using the QDOT approach. Uh, but yes, I, I think that that's possible. Good. Thanks so much. Hello? Hello? Yeah, so, so I had a question uh, about soluble protein. Uh, if something were to change the binding constant uh, of a partner molecule to a rest in um, light, maybe, uh, do you have any idea of the time course of the change of concentrations? Yeah, so... Um... It, I guess the question is, what is this? What is it, and what what kind of thing could be changing that? Uh, um, you know, one can fantasize about things like calcium changes that might lead, maybe directly or indirectly, to the change in affinity for um, cell association. Um, and so then we're talking about uh, you know millisecond to second time frame for the calcium changes to occur. I don't really like that as much because those are tend to be very transient uh, changes and you know the calcium changes don't necessarily last for long periods of time, but with steady illumination that might happen. Um, but yeah, th that would be relatively quick change. Uh, but then once you've sort of um, released the association there is the, um, the the diffusional redistribution that takes place, and and that um, that takes uh, some time, uh, minutes actually, uh, for the redistribution, especially in the outer segment because of the disc membranes which produce a significant uh, uh, diffusion um, 
uh, tortuosity factor. Yeah. Professor Imanishi. Uh, thank you very much. I always learn a lot from your talk. Uh, <laughs> my question is about the arresting translocation. So based on your static volume exclusion model, do you expect uh, any impact of uh, arresting impact of arresting translocation on the phototransduction? So if this is a mechanism of maintaining the concentration of the free arresting, probably light dependent translocation may not have much impact on determination. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So it, what I think it amounts to is, uh, you know, is the movement of arrestin into the outer segment an adaptive mechanism uh, where you are increasing the free concentration of arrestins that might then speed the binding to phosphorylated rhodopsins? Or is it just a binding sink where rhodopsins are generated with, phosph with phosphates uh, and uh, then just drawing the rest in there, which wouldn't be an adaptive mechanism, it would be more of a protective mechanism. Um, and you know, that, that, uh, um, you know, that, uh, those ideas have been bandied around um, by folks like uh, Vadim uh, and others uh, who have studied this kind of phenomenon. Uh, and so uh, in order for it to be an adaptive mechanism, you do have to uh, uh, have free arrest and movement to the outer segment. Now there is an interesting um, observation that, that the Arshavsky group had, and that is that at uh, sort of moderately dim light levels, light levels that saturate the photoreceptor but don't produce uh, a, a large number of bleached phosphorylated rhodopsins, they see this sort of stu super stoichiometric movement to the amount of rhodopsin activated of arrestin into the outer segment. Now that could be an adaptive mechanism, uh, but how that works uh, is, is not clear at this time. Uh, it's not clear if there is a regulation of mul multimerization. We don't know anything about this. And that's ma mainly because we haven't been able to measure this in living cells. We don't understand any sort of physiological impact on, on the arrest and oligomerization uh, that might result from physiological activity in the cells. And so, you know, our hope is that our approach using the multi-photon uh, uh, fame microscopy uh, will get us there so that we can actually start measuring uh, the interactions in, in the living cells. Uh, we're getting close. It's a challenging project. <laughs> Very cool study. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, maybe Dr. Williams is ready. Yeah, great talk, Peter. I uh, enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I just have um, so a question from your sort of actin corralling uh, studies. Um, I just wondered if you could envisage the role for a, uh, a myosin in helping with the actual corralling or in actually moving them out of the corrals. And, of course, I'm thinking particularly of something like myosin 7A, which is not really a, a processive motor per se, but something, well, A, it's found in the connecting cilium, uh, and B, it um, tends to tether uh, organelles, and uh, um, we don't know about proteins, but uh, it could potentially um, affect localization. Yeah, that's a great question, and, and um, uh, I think that it would be a very interesting thing to to look at, right? So, um, you know, if if there were a, a regulation of the shape of the corral or or how tightly the corral is associated with the membrane and things like that, I can envision that that might be a regulatory mechanism by which uh, you're sort of opening uh, access and closing access to corrals in a dynamic way using, using uh, myosin, myosin 7A is certainly a good candidate. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And uh, uh, we plan to do some experiments where we're manipulating uh, um, you know, myosin activity uh, and seeing if that changes the corral behavior or, uh, and so forth. So um, yeah, great idea. Okay, well, that'd be great experiments. Yeah, look forward to them. Yeah. Okay, let's go from LA to North Carolina. Julian. 
Hi, actually, I'm sitting in uh, I'm sitting in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, in the RD meeting at the moment. <laughs> but um, Peter, <laughs> well, it's, I, uh, I, that is amazing that you took time out for this from that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always to hear you talk, always for sure. <laughs> um, but I really, I mean, this is such impressive work to get to this sort of um, resolution and scale. It's just amazing. Um, so I'm I'm really love this model of sort of. Um, you know, the nascent disc act, acting as a sink for diffusion of, of membrane proteins like rhodopsin and all these things. So I just been wondering if you have any sort of thoughts or speculation on how, how a membrane protein might not get into the discs, like a plasma membrane protein, how you would maybe restrict something from sort of just going in, in with everything else. Yeah, that's a really great question, right? Uh, um, and I, I just, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if I have an answer for that. I mean, I can imagine things like, uh, there, you know, be, there being a binding partner for those plasma membrane proteins that are sort of moving it in one particular direction on the, you know, as the discs are forming or as the discs are actually internalizing or something like that. And your, you know, your group. Uh, with Vadim and, and those guys have, have proposed really interesting ideas like that. And so, so um, you know, I, I, I agree with that. I think that sounds great. Um, I, I don't know how to measure it uh, offhand, but I think it would be really cool to try to figure out how to do that. Uh, crucial, actually. We really need to see that. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. All right. Let's move to uh, Vice Chairman Vladimir. Hey Peter, very impressive work. Thank you for your talk. Uh, quick Thank comment you. related to Yoshi's question and your answer to it. Hmm. So uh, with Kata Korwal with us a few years ago, we did a study where we looked at the method three lifetime as a function of arresting expression. And we found that it's actually significantly slower in arresting knockouts and also significantly accelerated in uh, mouse rods overexpressing arresting. So that may have some relevance, again, as a protective effect. You can make the argument that slowing down the visual cycle might actually be ultimately protective for the rods in, in mm. the right line. So again, something just to think about. Uh, and oh, my that's, question, that's great, yeah. 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 And, and my, my question, and I'm sure you get this a lot and you're probably sick of it, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, for the first part of your talk, you mentioned that the steric volume exclusion accounts for most of arresting distribution. And I think you were obviously very careful in qualifying this. So uh, Clay Smith, I, again, you, you know, he published a paper about 10 years ago suggesting that PKC and AT activation and ATP actually modulate arresting movement as well. So I would love to hear your take of kind of the, the big picture and how your work fits and what really the mechanism is and what, what do you think about all this? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think that that's a, a, a good point. And I, uh, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that this um, sort of passive biophysical mechanism uh, is necessarily working entirely on its own. I think that there could be uh, uh, um, other, other factors in, that are regulating the distribution. Um, that would be more, uh, I think, of a sort of uh, light-dependent movement to the outer segment kind of mechanism um, rather than a localization to the inner segment. So yeah, I mean, anything that, uh, you know, rhodopsin is a binding sink, uh, um, uh, phosphonosetides, anything that might, uh, you know, uh, binding to lipids in the outer segment might contribute to the outer segment uh, distribution. But the question of how things are are localized to the inner segment, which is really what I was focused on here, is 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 um, uh, is is really a, a sort of vexing question. And I think that the steric volume exclusion mechanism uh, is is the best bet for explaining that. You know, and one of the things that's always seen with arresting distributions and dark adaptive photoreceptors is it's really much uh, it, it's it's very localized to. Uh, uh, well, I would say it's very uh, much so excluded from the outer segment in a way. Um, but when you look at the distribution along the uh, the inner segment, uh, all the way down to the synapse, it almost looks like it's uniformly spread there. And so how do you get that kind of uniform distribution in the inner segment with binding partners that are localized places? And so I do think that, you know, that the steric volume exclusion mechanism 
uh, uh, provides in a way the most reasonable explanation for its localization in the dark. Okay, thank you. And if I can squeeze one quick uh, final question. So sure. for the second part of your talk, have you thought at all about how GPCRs partitioning cones versus rods? And do you think there may, may be any interesting differences between them or do you think they do it pretty much the same way? Uh, so cones, uh, so, you know, Wolfgang's paper is really interesting where he uh, did the conditional knockout of uh, KIF-3A, um, uh, didn't have an effect on rods, but it did on cones. And so it seems uh, probable that cones actually are utilizing some sort of IFT-based mechanism for transporting uh, their opsin molecules. And so, um, uh, yeah. I, I would say that that's you know you know something to explore further for sure. Peter, I have a question related to the dimerization. You have affinity of the order of uh, fifty micromolar or about, uh, and this is in the context of uh, your buffer that you use. Once you have such a huge amount of membranes and low affinity for rhodopsin, unphosphorylated rhodopsin, and other proteins. How relevant this 50 micromolar, this is, you would say, non-specific almost uh, in biochemistry that you have such a low affinity, uh, I mean, really not. Uh, how that could be translated into in vivo with completely different set of uh, partner proteins, high concentration of those elements. Uh, that's yeah, really yeah, sure. in vivo. I mean, in terms of the dimerization of arrestin versus it binding to something else, is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know, you have metal yeah. ions. This is very sensitive to metal ions as sure. well, calcium, sure. magnesium. Right. So, um, yeah. So uh, the bottom line to that really is that so far, the arrestin binding partners that are non-rhodopsin, uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, tubulin and, and the other proteins, they're present in, in vastly lower concentrations than arrestin. And so, yeah, I mean, maybe they have higher affinity for those proteins than for themselves, but there's so few of them uh, that it probably doesn't impact uh, the level of dimerization very much. Now, what about ions? Yeah, there could be metal ions that might be involved with this. But again, um, you would need to have millimolar concentrations of metal ions to really be driving a, a separation if they were operating that way. Like for instance, you know, we've we've thought a lot about whether calcium might be regulating uh, the the dimerization of arrestin, but there just isn't enough free calcium in the in, in the photoreceptor to 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 produce that kind of an effect at 500 nanomolar versus millimolar arrestin. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but well, I don't. I, I'm more even interested in membranes, that there is a finite of arresting to membranes and, and you have sufficient amount of them to um, buffer arresting, if you will. Uh, yes, uh, in the outer segment, there's certainly lots of membranes to buffer arresting, but I'm not sure that in the cell body or the inner segment there is. I mean. Again, we're talking about a huge concentration of arrestin. Uh, uh, there, you know, there's there's much few, much less membrane surface area in the in the cell body than there is in the outer segment. So, um, you know, and and certainly, you know, the observation is that arrestin, you know, isn't present in the outer segment of dark adaptive photoreceptors. So even if it were, you know, if it had a reasonable affinity for disc membranes. I mean, it's not moving to the outer segment, so it's not strong enough to draw it there. All right, Chris. Yeah, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I had a couple of quick questions on the first part. Uh, were you able to do the oligomeric, uh, oligomeric measurements with bovine mutants with respect to those non-oligomerizing mutants from the Gurovich lab studies? Yeah, that's a great question. No, we haven't, we haven't even tried to do it. Um, we, we were thinking about doing it, but, you know, that's such beautiful work that they did, and and we what we were mainly trying to do is just uh, you know confirm that our approach, which is different than theirs, they actually use uh, laser light scattering to measure the um, 
you know, the, the oligomerization and we're using analytical ultrasound navigation. And so we just felt it was really important to reproduce the results with our hands using our method. And, and that's the reason that, why, that we did it. But it is a good point. I mean, it, you know, we, we could, uh, um, you know, try to visit that again for, for bovine arresting. I think what's more interesting in a way though is to try to understand where the interaction domain is on the amphibian arrest and, and uh, that's stuff that we're kind of working on now. Yeah, certainly in the context of your studies. Um, and then a second question, if the uh, P44 mutant uh, freely diffuses and is simply missing the uh, seed tail, does that uh, show up in your oligomer uh, oligomerizing um, detection method and also uh, does it make sense that maybe the sea tail would have something to do with maintaining the intersegment localization and, and how that might come into like your mutant studies, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I can tell you is, and Cassandra, I think she might be on this uh, video chat here. Uh, um, uh, she tried a truncation of the sea terminal domain, making it effectively a P44. Uh, in the Xenopus arrest, and, and I think that it didn't uh, inhibit the dimerization at all. Uh, so again, um, interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder if that would translate to the to the bovine as well, or to the mammalian, that kind of thing. So. Uh, it's a good question. I, I um, yeah, we'll have to think about that. Thank you. Okay, so last uh, two quick questions from. Uh, or oh, one question from Zach, and then we're going to uh, final comments from Vlad Vladimir. Okay. I <laughs> can I stop sharing so we can see each other? Let me, sorry, I've been sharing this whole time. There we go. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your really interesting talk. Um, so I kind of have more of a conceptual question related to arrest and oligomerization. Um, provided that it actually uh, exists in vivo. Um, so would there be some sort of like biological advantage of evolving higher order arrestin multimerization in mam like mammalian photoreceptors as opposed to amphibian photoreceptors? And how would that affect like the kinetics of diffusion uh, in response to light? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, um, um, so I can I don't really have a, a good answer for it. I can speculate a little bit. Um, one thing that's really interesting is uh, that uh, Siva Gurievich uh, um, has shown that uh, when he expresses the mutant, he, he makes these mutant, mutant arrestins, bovine arrestins, and expresses them, or I think he's doing it with mouse arrestin in the mice. Um, these mutants that uh, inhibit the uh, oligomerization, uh, it tends to be toxic for the cells. And so his idea is that uh, uh, monomeric or, you know, if you really consider um, his, his sort of affinity for the mutant arrestins to form dimers, I would say that most of it is in a dimer form in his cells. So maybe the dimer is, is toxic somehow to the mammalian photoreceptors. And so by um, in, you know, increasing them to tetramers, you're sort of uh, removing that toxicity. So that's, that's one possibility. And maybe, maybe the amphibian photoreceptors just don't have that sensitivity. Um, um, it'll be interesting to see. So far, you know, um, uh, so that's, that's sort of the speculation for why uh, you know, mammalian arrestins might form higher order all the all of them is, you know, maybe to protect them from the toxic toxic nature of monomer or dimer arrestin. Thank you. I, I think we will pass on Vladimir because he got too nervous about uh, making <laughs> final comments and now he's sad. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have to have a final comments for uh, from uh, Professor Arshavsky. Vladim. I'm, un I'm unmuting. Well, beauty, beautiful talk, Peter, really. I mean, I kind of, I, I can't wait till you will figure out, you know, the whole arrest and story because you know, we're, we're buffled. I mean, we published in 06 and we're buffled by the result. You know, we checked and rechecked and rechecked and we always seen the super stoichiometric movement of arresting 
over the amount of Rodops and Blitched, but kind of we could never understand. So, I mean, I can, I mean, I totally agree with every one speculation you have. And I think Chris brought it up that arrestin uh, might be phosphorylated perhaps. And I think that if arrestin is indeed phosphorylated, that again is not relevant necessarily. Ah, it's kind of, I don't know, it's an apple, no. It, it's, it's relevant to everything. So what might be happening is phosphorylation could be a simple mechanism by which you regulate monomerization, dimerization. And the moment when you perhaps at certain light intensity have a signal in the cell, which triggers arrest and phosphorylation, perhaps when cell is approaching saturation or, or somewhere there, then perhaps you kind of go to this uh, condition when uh, outer segment is now uh, deprived of arrestin, of the small amount of arrestin, which is sitting there in the dark and, you know, hungry red ops and needs more and more to be quenched. And at that moment, you somehow modulate the equilibrium between dimer and monomer or oligomer and monomer. And, and at that point, you know, monomers through this Peter's diffusional mechanisms are rushing to the other uh, segment for rescue. And now you don't run out of arrestin. Yeah. And why you wanted to keep low concentration of arrest in, in the dark, perhaps you just don't want to have too much so you're not turning off redopsin too quickly. So I mean, Absolutely. I mean, but I, I just can't wait. You know, it has, I have been waiting. I have been waiting for 15 years patiently. <laughs> I just can't wait to, and you'll finally figure out, you know, when this uh, arrest yeah. is rushing in, 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 in light, if indeed it's more monomeric in the uh, outer yeah. segment. Yeah. I, I just... I, I just I agree and, and I think for it, you know developing this amazing biophysical techniques to do that. Yeah, I hope that we'll have an answer for you. I have a, I have a, I have a few ideas that I can't really talk about right now, but uh, um, I'm hoping that we can um, find the answer sooner rather than later. Well, you you tell me which <laughs> scotch to buy when you do that. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. It was really enjoyable. And I appreciate uh, coming and seeing you all.